And let's turn to the book of Matthew, um, chapter 5. <clears throat> Officially, this is the Law and Grace class. <clears throat> um, truthfully and spiritually, it genuinely is the law <clears throat> and the contrast of the Lamb. And um, I say that because I want you to really start honing in on that um, because I'm going to go through a bunch of scriptures here. We'll, we'll do one more. Um, I've got some great stuff on the rest of the Beatitudes, but I feel that I'll never get anything done if I don't move on to some other things. Uh, so we will cover uh, verse 7, Matthew 5, 7, but... <clears throat> Um, I want to really, really encourage you to take seriously what we're saying here about that there's a contrast, that Jesus, Jesus is preaching for the first time in a big audience. This is the beginning of his ministry. This is the early part of it. And, um, and what he is saying in contrast to the law is incredible. But I, don't, I think it's so simple that I don't think we get it off right off. I think that we, especially those of us who have been Christians any length of time, we tend to put things in a certain pocket and, and you know, that's, that's what that is. So I'm going to really ask you to ask the Holy Spirit, even now, that um, he would help us to uh, go through this in the true spirit in which I felt like the Lord wanted us to do. Um, all right, so uh, Matthew 5, 7. Blessed are the merciful, <clears throat> for they shall obtain mercy. And uh, uh, mercy, mercy is such a big deal, Old Testament, New Testament, and all that. <clears throat> but um, to, uh, to find mercy under the law, under the law. You remember Deuteronomy, don't you? Deuteronomy 28, we went there before, and that's where we saw the contrast of Mount Ebal and Mount Gerizim. And, um, and in fact, let me, instead of you turning there, let me read to you um, what it says concerning mercy, okay? And this is law. This is old covenant mercy. <coughs> All right. And it shall come to pass, if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe and to do all his commandments, which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above the nations of the earth, and all these blessings shall come on, uh, come on thee and overtake thee, if thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. <coughs> I'm um, skipping down a few verses, but it doesn't matter. And uh, this is, so this begins to tell you if you don't do all these things. And thou shalt uh, not go aside. <clears throat> Let me make sure that I've got. Yeah. And thou shalt not go aside from any of the words which I command thee this day, to the right or to the left, to go after other gods, to serve them, but it shall come to pass, if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe and to do all his commandments and his statutes, which I command thee this day, all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. Now, I'm not going to read them all, and these are not in the ones that we read in the other class. This, although it's in the same chapter, it's just lower than, what, than we went. The Lord shall send, now this is, this, is, this is the lack of mercy here. I mean, this is, if, if, if you don't do what God says, here's the mercy or the lack thereof that, that comes. <clears throat> the Lord shall send upon thee cursing, vexation, and rebuke in all that thou settest thine hand uh, unto for to do until thou be destroyed. And thou shalt perish quickly, 
because of the wickedness of thy doings, whereby thou hast forsaken me, the Lord shall make the pestilence cleave unto you until you, uh, till he have consumed thee from off the land whither thou goest to possess it. The Lord shall smite thee with consumption and with a fever and with an inflammation and with an extreme burning and with the sword and with blasting and with mildew and they shall pursue thee until thou perish. And thy heaven that is over thy head shall be brass and the earth that is under thee shall be iron. The Lord shall make the rain of thy land powder and dust. From heaven shall it come down upon thee until thou be destroyed. The Lord shall cause thee to be smitten before thine enemies. Thou shalt go out one way and flee uh, seven ways before them. Thou shalt be removed into all the kingdoms of the earth, and thy carcass shall be meat unto all the fowls of the air and unto the beasts of the earth, and no man shall fray them away. The Lord will smite thee with the botch of Egypt and with the emeralds and with the scab and with the itch whereof thou canst not be healed. The Lord shall smite thee with madness and blindness and astonishment of heart. And I've already got it. <laughs> Just read now. All right. But remember, we're contrasting the lamb. Okay. So... Under the Lamb, mercy comes by giving mercy. <laughs> it just, <laughs> I mean, what, a, what an incredible deal. Okay? But we're talking about the Lamb. And here's, here's a couple of points in relationship to the things that we're going to be going through here. And that is, in Matthew 5, you're either going to see how the lamb himself is contrasted to the law, or we're going to see how the lamb is contrasted to us. But it's always going to be a contrast of the lamb, and the law is out because it, it's, it's inadequate. It's not sufficient for what God wants. <clears throat> and of course it's not because it falls short of him. It falls short of his nature. Okay, so I just wrote this, but under the lamb mercy comes... By giving mercy, it is obtained by being something, being merciful. Wow. That's the lamb in us. That cannot just be a Christian virtue. It must be Jesus. It must be the one we love. It must be the one that we've asked to come inside of us. It must be the one that is everything to our heart. Amen. 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 Everything to our heart. Why would we settle for mercy from heaven and reject Jesus? And yet that's done all the time where people say, Lord, give me mercy. And yet this new covenant is based on this, this one, this one who died, bought it, and still fulfills it. See? Amen? Amen. It, be, uh, it is obtained by being something, being merciful. This is now to be an inward trait of he, speaking of Jesus, who dwells in you. At the cross we see mercy. It was the mercy of the lamb and not just Jesus, though, right? I mean, it was. It was the lamb that was slain. It was the fulfillment of every offering that ever went before, and every offering that ever went before basically was a lamb. I mean, in, in the context of the greater picture of doves and all this stuff, the lamb was always way offered more than the others. Without the lamb on the cross, we have no mercy. Without the Lamb manifesting mercy through us to others, we have no mercy. And so, so if we really take this to heart, this law versus Lamb thing is powerful, and that's what we want to do. And so I'm genuinely skipping a very large portion of the, some of the things, but I want to get to some, I want to start going through some of the rest of these things. So let's, um, let's go to verse 21. It's Matthew 5, 21 and 22. 
You have heard that it was said by them of old, Thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of judgment. But I say unto you that whoever, whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of judgment. And whoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. And whosoever say, Thou fool, shall be in danger, danger of hell fire. Keep your place here, because and if we do go anywhere else, keep your place in Matthew 5. But uh, let's look in, uh, I think this reference is correct, Luke 15. In verse 28, and this is the elder son, after the, the prodigal son has come back, and the father has run out to kiss him. The father has run out to embrace him, the, the prodigal son, and this is the elder son's stance. And he was angry and would not go in, therefore came his father out and entreated him. Okay, so in many of these... I'm just going to go ahead for, to expedite some things um, to just kind of read some of the things that the Lord gave to me. <clears throat> uh, this, is, this is about anger. This is about that thing. So he says, the law says don't kill, but I say unto you, you shall not be angry. Okay, this is lamb talk. Lamb talk. This is this is the that precious one who died for us. This gives us Jesus' contrast of nature and what and it gives us what is important. The law says the problem is a deed, an act to do something wrong. Don't kill. That's wrong. That deed is wrong. Okay? <clears throat> Um, so the law says that the problem is a deed to kill, but Jesus says that it's the motive that leads to the act that corrupts, that counts. The, the motive behind it was you're, ang you're angry with. Jesus' um, anger without a cause. Okay, so how many times... Have we been angry and then said, well, I have a cause. I have a genuine cause. Jesus' cause for anger would be different than selfish anger or anger due to hurt feelings or wounded pride. Amen? And how many times have we had hurt feelings or wounded pride and got angry with somebody and justified it when Jesus says that's not anger that has a true cause? That's selfish, self-motivated, not lamb spirit. See? So that's why Jesus just goes, don't, don't give me thou shall not kill. Don't make this thing about deeds. This is about motives. This is about your heart. And folks, it's always about your heart. And if we would really understand that, then we would know that it's always about his heart. And anyone that has walked with the Lord any length of time that has delved into a true, genuine desire and hope to see his heart, it has to be about their heart. It can't be about all of the things that, you know, well, I want to know, I want to know Jesus. And really what we want to know is we want to know a bunch of deep things to impress people. Or, or something. Or something. That goes back to the motive, not just the deed, see. We say, oh, Jesus, I know you'll accept this. I'm pursuing you. And he'll go, what's, what's in your heart? What's in your heart? And then he, you know, and it's, it's, it's better to not say, well, tell me, because it's, it's never pretty. You know? <laughs> All right, we're going to move to verse 23. And we're going to read 23 through 26. Therefore... If thou bring thy gift to the altar, and there, rem there remember that thy brother hath anything against thee, 
leave there thy gift before the altar and go thy way. First be reconciled to thy brother, then come and offer thy gift. Agree with thine adversary quickly while thou art in the way, lest at any time the adversary deliver thee to the judge, and the judge deliver to thee the officer, and thou shalt be cast into prison. Verily I say unto thee, Thou shalt by no means come out from there till thou hast paid the other most farthing. This is saying, this is giving you, if you don't do it by lamb, it's going to come to you by law. Does that make sense? Because that's, that's kind of what it's saying. If you don't do it this way, then, you know. All right. So, um, you have been told to go to the temple, slay your animal and appease God, and then your sins will be forgiven. But I say, before you seek the temple, you be the lamb, so go seek out your brother and be reconciled. You be the lamb. And that's what it's calling for. It's, it's not calling for justice, it's not. I, you know, I don't know how well any and all of you understand this contrast. I know that there are people, probably people within this fellowship still, maybe even in this room, that justice is such a big deal. But let me tell you, if justice was such a big deal with God, we'd all be in hell. And we, you know, we would, ne if justice was really, there has to be something higher than justice. And the only thing higher than justice is mercy or or lamb spirit or selfless giving or whatever front you want to put it on because that's what saved us and yet we turn around and we want them to pay the uttermost farthing you know and we'll we'll actually get into some uh depending on how far i get on this i'd like to get into some of the stories and parables that jesus tell and over and over and over again bam it's lamb in contrast to really when you say law it's lamb in contrast to our mindset if we have not been renewed in the spirit of our mind or more importantly or a better wording if we have not let this mind this lamb mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus because if you hadn't you're going to demand justice and if you demand justice then you're going to get justice and if you and, God, and if justice is brought to you it's not pretty You'll be in that prison until you've paid all. Um, let's see. You know, I only had one sentence on that, and I read it to you, but I'm going to read it again. It's long, as usual. Me and Paul had a lot in common. We write long sentences. <clears throat> you have been told to go to the temple, slay your animal, and appease God. Then your sins will be forgiven. But I say, before you seek the temple, you be the lamb. So go and seek out your brother and be reconciled. All right. So Matthew 27 now. And basically we're just going down the scriptures now. Um, 27 and 28, you have heard that it was said of them of old, thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. And if thy right, uh, right eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. And if it, um, for it is unprofitable for thee that one of thy members should perish and not that the whole body should be cast into hell. All right, so... Um, Jesus and I wrote this kind of the way I saw Jesus saying it you say don't commit adultery from which you judge actions yours as well as others you're judging actions don't commit adultery you're judging deeds there's no, there has nothing to do with the heart. You see. You say, well, you end up with the same result. Well, okay, maybe so, but here's the deal. Man looks on the outward appearance. God looks on the heart. 
Okay. So, um, so you say don't commit adultery from which you judge your actions as well as others. But I say don't look to lust. Okay, now listen to what this is saying. Don't look to lust, which means you must judge yourself to the core while not being able to judge the hidden secrets of the hearts of others. Don't commit adultery is to go like this for the most part. You, you, you know, you very seldom have somebody go, you know, I mean, it's, you know, it's primarily a tool that we use to point out other people's flaws and stuff. But he says, don't commit, don't lust in your heart. And he's going right to the core of us. That, st that starts right here. Does anybody see how that, that works? It actually goes to the core issues, first of all. And second of all, it takes it out of the realm of law that is judging others. And it puts it on the realm of the lamb where we're contrasted with him so that we would hopefully want to be conformed to the image of the lamb. Which is greater than, all of these are going to be greater, you know, you know, Moses, Solomon, da 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 da, but a greater is here now. And, and we have to see him as greater. And when I say that, what I mean is we have to see this lamb spirit, this lamb nature that is what we call Jesus Christ, the Messiah, Jesus being the name that was given him at, the, at birth. But lamb, he was a lamb slain before the foundation of the world, before there was a world. Doesn't say he was called Jesus before the foundation of the world. But lamb is not a title. It is an identification of his nature. It identifies his nature, lamb upon the throne. And to see it in that realm and to truly see him, because what we're talking about, what we're talking about is seeing him. I was, uh, I, when uh, Jim and me and Scott and others uh, of the men in Ireland, when we had the men's meeting, we talked much about <clears throat> the woman uh, with the alabaster box. And at a certain juncture, I said, you know, I think the real issue, and I still think this, so I'm going to say it again, I think the real issue there, they were all getting excited about the fact that he was, that she was breaking this and the cost of that and, the, and, and looking at her actions. And, and so then we start, we, we're like the 12 disciples or anybody else there, or we're, we're, maybe we're not like them. Maybe we're going, oh, this is a, a beautiful thing. And, and, we're, and we're going, this is, this is what I want to be like. But she has no thought for herself. She, the, 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 the sweet odor that's going up in her, to her is right there sitting there, Jesus. He's the sweet odor. He's the, this is nothing to her. Break it, da 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 da. That, that filled the room. He's filling her heart, her being. She is seeing him, and you know, I, you know, most, I think most of you actually that are here weren't there, so I don't know. But I, I went on to share during the conference um, the fact that this Mary that came in and did this was Mary of Bethany, and she was the same one that earlier sat at Jesus' feet. And Martha said, Lord, make her get up and come serve. We're serving you. We're, we're, a, we're trying to do something for you. And Jesus says, let her alone. It doesn't, it doesn't tell us anything Jesus said to her because apparently he had a one-person audience. Doesn't tell us one thing only that girl heard it, apparently, because Martha didn't get it. So she's meditating on what, she, what, what he said. But she was apparently getting more than just a teaching. This was more than a class, more than just a teaching from Jesus on a mount. She is literally, he is, for whatever reason, uh, the, I think the way the terminology I used is 
that he at that time actually was the box that was opened up and he opened his heart and he poured into her. And so from that time until two days before his death, when she comes in and breaks the alabaster box, she's meditating on the things that he has said to her. And Jesus gives us a hint as to what was going on. He says, let her alone to the disciples now, not to Martha. Let her alone. She had done this for my burial. She didn't say, this is, this is going to count for my burial. She said, he said, she knows what she's doing and did this because she got my lamb spirit. She got my nature poured over her and she meditated on it and she loved it. And she's come in here knowing two days he'd be gone. And she's saying, I'm, I am... I just want to honor your spirit and your heart and the beauty of your selfless giving. Yeah. And she was totally enthralled with him and this nature. And, and it drew things out of her that seeing it happen over here cannot draw out of us. See, it can't. We can look at that woman all day and never be that woman or have that woman's spirit. She got that by not focusing on herself. She got that by focusing on him and, go, and, and totally being lost in him and her greatest desire was to let him know how beautiful he is in being in nature to her. That's it. That's it. And I was thinking of it tonight when I, when I was leaving the house. I was thinking we always say or pray, oh Lord, be glorified tonight in the worship or in the morning in the worship or in whatever we do, be glorified. And it just, you know, I, I, it just came to me Oh, Lord, be gratified. And I thought, to be glorified, at least in our religious concept, is way different than for him to be gratified and him to go, I'm so, like with this woman, let her alone. I am so gratified that this happened. I'm taking this into my grave with me. I'm taking this with me into my death. And not only that, but this will be a memorial throughout all time. That's how much it reached his heart. Oh, Jesus, be gratified, be satisfied, be, you know, not just be glorified. And we go, well, we said the right stuff, and I bet it, I, you know, and uh, I, we glorified Jesus to other people. We glorified Jesus to other people. So the whole congregation can say, we glorified Jesus. I mean, the question that came to my mind as I was meditating on this is, yeah, but let's ask him, is he satisfied? Is he gratified with our gathering? With whatever it is we think we glorified him with? He goes, no, you're just going through the motions. I mean, you know, I believe that there's something in your heart, but it wasn't this something that this girl had. <laughs> you know? And Jesus didn't turn to the disciples and say, you guys are stupid. You know, he didn't do that. It wasn't stupid. It just wasn't this. It just wasn't this that she was doing. Anyway. I didn't mean to get off on all that, but I asked the Holy Spirit to. Um, oh, um, I don't know if I can remember how it, how it came. Yes.
vocal to God and you want him to hear. It just came to my heart that Mary knew this man in her house, even though he was a prophet and maybe even in sight, she knew this guy who was in the presence of her home, what's in him. Well, because isn't it, isn't it, at least from his side, isn't it the same thing he did with Mary in Bethany when M Martha was cooking the meal? I mean, he's really opening that he's a lamb here in Matthew 5. But I don't know how many people ever go, you know what, this is the contrast of what went before from Genesis to Malachi. And this is Matthew 5, and this is the beginning of him going, look, this is what it's all about. And we're going, well, this is, this is simple. This is, too, this is simple stuff. Yeah, let's be merciful and da-da-da-da and just miss Jesus. That's what the disciples did. They missed Jesus. They, when she was doing that, they said, why this waste? They missed, they did, he's going, this I'm carrying with me into my burial and it will be a memorial throughout all ages wherever the gospel is preached and they're going, oh, this is kind of a waste. Didn't understand it, didn't understand it. I don't, I don't know, maybe I should attempt this. Uh, we did read uh, Matthew 5, 29 and 30, so let's do it again. And if thy right hand offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee, for it is uh, profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish and not that thy whole body should be cast into hell. And if thy right hand offend thee, cut it off and cast it from thee, for it is profitable for thee that one of thy members should perish and not that the whole body should be cast into hell. I wrote a parable and I can't find it. In fact, I wrote about <laughs> 10 parables one day. <laughs> I don't remember why. They're somewhere, either I, I have like desktop and laptop and iPad and phone and everything, so I have no clue where it ended up. So I'm going to try to give you this parable. There was, there was um, once this, this, uh, this man that started this little gathering of people, and they gathered together, and they ended up forming just a little community and um, this, this man um, read this scripture and he said, you know, um, I, I want to serve God. I want, I want to be as with the Lord as I can. And so he cut off his right hand. And so everyone else saw that the man's heart was so after the Lord and everything. So everybody in the little community cut off their right hand. Um, uh, and one day, after many years, one of the members, he was a seafarer, and he went off, and he got into a ship, and back then, when you sailed, you know, you could be gone for years, actually, and so, um, um, so a, um, um, let's see if I can remember how I wrote this, so uh, a, a disease struck and killed everybody in that village. And a young man came to be there, and um, he had had a heart after God also. But he, how did I put it? He was, oh, that was, long, that was a while back. He, had, he saw that in the scripture, and he said, you know, if you cut off your da 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 da. So he looked in the mirror and, and he cut off his left hand, not his right hand. And he goes to the village and everyone's dead, but the sailor comes back. And the sailor sees him and they say, what sort of heretic are you that you, you have cut off your left hand? And we all gave our life and gave our right hand and everything. And you're evil. And, you, and he killed the young man and started a new community. All right, 
moral of the story? The moral of the story is the heart motivation was, which, you know, you need to, but the, the heart motivation is I'm going to do something for Jesus, and I'm going to do something because I'm committed. I'm going to cut my right hand off, okay? So then someone else, they get mixed up, they look in the mirror or something, and they end up cutting their left hand off all out of the same exact motivation of heart for the Lord, and we condemn them because it's, that's the wrong hand. That's called the law. That's the law. That is nothing but the law. And yet we do stuff like that all the time. We judge people because of this or that, or what we judge people because of the color of their skin. We judge people because uh, we judge uh, women because well, they, you know, they're not as capable or whatever. All the all the wrong things that causes judgments that are fall short of the Lamb's spirit. That fall short of the Lamb's spirit. Anyway, that's all I'm going to say on that one. Okay, let's go to 33, verse 33, and um, through 30, hmm, 37. Again, you've heard, it, uh, heard that it hath been said by them of old, Thou shalt not perjure thyself, but thou shalt perform unto the Lord thine oaths. But I say unto you, swear not at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth, for it is his footstool, neither by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. Neither shalt, uh, see, yeah, neither shalt thou swear by thy, hand, uh, thy head, because thou cannot make one hair white or black, uh, but let your communication be yea, 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 and nay, nay, for whatever is more than these cometh of evil. All right, so we can, we can jump on the law. We can jump on the law and we can say, okay, you, you shouldn't swear. This is the same thing as the hand thing. You shouldn't swear. You shouldn't be saying things, you know, uh, like this. And we make it a thing of a deed again, just like the law is always a thing of a deed never the thing of a motive, and never the thing of the, having the lamb nature, or the motive of the lamb. So here's what I wrote on uh, Matthew 5, 33 through 37. You should not be swearing, making oaths, or making commitments or promises at all. Okay, but here's why. Under the law, you have no ability to keep any of it. The law demands that you perform it, verse 33. It demands you perform that. You just put yourself under the law. He's not telling you what, he's not going, that's a bad deed. It's going to lead to this. It's not his spirit and it's not his nature in you. It's not Christ in you. It is you embracing uh, teachings and designations of what's right and wrong based on deeds and actions and not based on motive. It's it's pointing away from Christ, and it's pointing away from his spirit. <clears throat> um, uh, the law demands that you perform it, verse 33, but you should not be putting yourself in a law position in the first place. If you understand the true basis of the new co covenant, Christ is that basis of the new covenant. The lamb is that basis of the new covenant. Uh, who are you to swear by heaven when you can't be faithful in earth? Verse 34. <laughs> That's basically what it's saying. Well, you shouldn't be swearing by heaven. You, you're not even doing that good in earth. <laughs> um, uh, who are you to make commitments based upon someone else's house when you don't even own it? Remember, swear by God's house. Especially God's. In verse 35, stop swearing by things that are not in your possession, for all, that it, for all that is his and falls under his responsibility, and he will perform it. Okay, so we're going back to he will perform it. We're going back to if you want it fulfilled, stop trying to do it by I'm, I'm going to, I will show my deep commitment by swearing which shows that we don't understand the basis of the new covenant. 
we're still trying to perform it. You know, and it doesn't matter if it's an Old Testament commandment or, you know, cut off your right hand or whatever. We're going to set about to try to perform that instead of realizing. And this is what he's saying. This is, you know, um, let's see. He's, basically, he's saying, well, the, the house isn't yours. Heaven isn't yours. All of this stuff. He's going down the line and he's saying, all of this is not your responsibility. So you shouldn't be making decisions or saying things based on that. Because you have no say in it at all. And in the Lamb and in the nature of Jesus, it's not our say that counts. It's his spirit. It's his nature. That's the only thing that counts. Which he basically says that. Um, but even if it relates to that which is in your own possession, you still have no ability to control its outcome, hair black or white. <laughs> That's my hair. You still don't have any ability, trust me, I, you don't, I don't anyway. <laughs> you have no ability to make that decision. Uh, you know, you say, well, clear all or whatever. <laughs> Okay, well, you, you still haven't changed the hair. You've only changed what's on top of it. <laughs> and so, you know, we're always trying to work something because we haven't embraced the, the nature of the Lamb, the nature of Christ. We haven't embraced life in us. We've only embraced a new form of the law where we're trying to... And see, all of these things are not bad. Every one of them that we've read up to this point are not bad. They are things that someone is trying to please God. Yeah. Which, you cannot please God under the law. You cannot please God under the law. <clears throat> Um, so, uh, the Sabbath is fulfilled when you enter into rest, trusting him to be the work and to do the work. The Sabbath is fulfilled not by keeping Saturday or, you know. I mean, there are a lot of Christians that think that, that Sunday is the Sabbath, and it's not. <laughs> Saturday was the Sabbath in, in Israel. And then we came along and changed our meeting time to Sunday, but Saturday's the Sabbath. So they go, well, I, I, don't do, I don't do anything but go to church on Sunday and watch football. But, that's, <laughs> but I don't move, you know. <laughs> you know. But you see, all of those kind of thinkings, all of that that I just expressed, is some sort of a wine dangling, that's my Texas way of putting this, way of us being involved in it and trying to produce it instead of letting it be the result of either the work of Christ, the Lamb of God that died and brought it about, or the nature of Christ that lives within us that will fulfill, not keep it, will fulfill it. And the fulfillment of that looks very different in new covenant relations than it does old covenant relationship. Old covenant relationship is don't, don't pull your ox out of a ditch on the Sabbath. New covenant relationship is we're not talking about oxen and stuff. We're talking about, and, and the example I always use on this front is when, when Jesus got accused of doing something on the Sabbath. I think it's uh, John 5, and they accused, you know, and this was, the, this was the Pharisees, this was the law, looking at the lamb and saying, you heal that man on the Sabbath. And Jesus' response wasn't, mm, you know, um, yeah, I did. And there's another place where he does say, I'm the Lord of the Sabbath. But this one, he didn't do that. He said, he said, I didn't do it. And they go, well, somebody, no, they didn't say that, but I mean, they're, they're looking at it, this guy's healed and you touched him, so you must have been the one. No, they said, you healed him on the Sabbath, and he said, no, I didn't, and his response was, my father did it. Uh, no, my father who dwelleth in me did it. And he's saying, that's the Sabbath, it, it was okay. I hope y'all are seeing that. 
He's saying that that was okay because here's the true Sabbath. When it's Christ in you, it's no longer you doing the work. It is, it is God who worketh in us to will and to do of his good pleasure. Philippians, I can't remember. It, is, it has to be the result of of, of him who brings rest to us by him functioning as our life. You, could, you know, you could say, well, the father, then he broke the Sabbath. You know, I mean, you can, you'll find some way around this. But in truth, in every situation, like the way the Godhead works is, you know, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and they are always working, you know, declaring one another. They're not declaring themselves. They're not doing the work. They're not, you know, the, you search it out and you really look at the scriptures on this and you begin to realize that none of them are taking the credit to themselves and they always are working for the benefit of the other. It's a spirit. It's, it's what's called God. That's what's called God, not just a supreme being. Think about it. Because this is, when we use God, oh, the supreme being, you know. Well, yeah, he is, but, there's, but what is that being? And what is the nature of that being? Oh, it doesn't matter. It just means he's the big boss. Then that's our relationship with God. It's simply saying that you're bigger than everybody else. So we should do what you say rather than have the nature of the Son working in us where we don't declare ourselves, we declare Jesus. The Holy Spirit declares Jesus. The Father sends the Holy Spirit. He doesn't come on his own. Jesus is declaring the Father. Every ounce of this, it's shooting all the It doesn't just go around and around. It's shooting all over the place where they are. It is a constant flow of energy toward one another and away from themselves. It's, and that nature, that, you know, that's why in the book of Revelation over and over it says, all glory and honor to the Lamb and to him that sits on the throne, the Father. Amen. It says that then, uh, what is it, Revelation 7, that they shall receive God's mark in their forehead. And then later in 14, it says, chapter 14, it describes what it is. The name of the Lamb and of his Father. His Father. The source of that Lamb nature. It's all one. They're one. They're one in nature and one and being. But they flow as three in one. They're one in being in nature. They're not different in nature. It's one nature. It's called God. But by being three in one, they're always honoring, blessing, doing on behalf of the other. You take the time to go through the scriptures and you'll be shocked at how, how much that's really in there. <clears throat> All right, let's try to finish this. Um, the Sabbath is fulfilled when you enter into rest, trusting him to, to be the work and do the work. But confine the use of your mouth to yes, sir, and no, sir. Because anything else comes from a place of you believe and you have some control. Amen. Let your communications be yea, yea, and nay, nay, for whatever else ever is more than that cometh of evil. And everything that went before this verse is talking about us making promises, making commitments, making oaths that we say we can perform. 
doesn't James say that? Don't say, you know, how's it go? Don't say, you know, uh, you know, tomorrow we shall do this and that. He says, you don't know what tomorrow brings. See, well, that's similar to this spirit. It's saying, look, you don't have control over this. You say, if God will, meaning, look, I'm a junior partner here <laughs> at best. <laughs> and what is your part in this uh, whole thing? Yay, yay, and nay, nay. You know, yes, Lord, and no, Satan. <laughs> that's, that's what I'm working up to here. All right, I'm wondering, I probably shouldn't start this next part. Um, but how about we read it and then we'll start the next class with reading it. It's uh, verse, this is Matthew 5, 38 through 42. You have heard that it hath been said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say unto you that you resist not evil. But whosoever shall smite thee on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. And if any man will sue thee at the law and take away thy coat, let him have thy cloak also. And whosoever shall compel thee to go a mile, go with him too. Give to him that asketh, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn not thou away. All right, so we'll come back to that next class. Take a break, go to the bathroom, stretch, whatever it's going to take, or leave if necessary.